Welcome to the podcast with a K. I'm Christian Corley. Joining me this week are James Baldock. Greetings, fellow citizens of Hoovania. Yes, and Simon Danes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, excellent. Understated. Lovely. And uh, it's Doctor Who chat this week on the podcast with a K with the um, the with um, I was going to call you the B team then, um, but actually you, I was going to call you the B team, and then as I thought about it and ha- thought how many podcasts James and I have done together, uh, James McLean and myself, I realised that you are now the A team. Hey, yeah. So there you go. Excellent. It's excellent, isn't it? It'd be nice to get one of those big podcasts going one day with all five of us. Yeah. So it's, hang on, let me count. Let me, James, James, Simon, Gareth. Yeah, five of us, yeah. I tell you yeah. what, maths is not my strong suit. Hmm. My strong suit. Like Maybe we should do like a video cast where we're all sort of sitting in a studio together and having a comp lab. Possibly. And a big gathering. A know. gathering, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, we 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 have some um, tentative plans for a uh, a live podcast later yeah. this year. Um, that requires a, a few. Um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, organisational and um, the logistical issues to be ironed out. Well, you don't want to hear about that now, dear listener. No, what you want to know is what we're going to talk about. Well, I do know. There are lots to talk. There is lots to talk about in the world of Doctor Who. It's almost as if they knew um, that us three were getting together and thought we'd better give them something to talk about. It's been months. There is no possible alternative explanation. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, yeah. So um, we, we've got five things we're going to be talking about. I'm, I'm going to give you a quick rundown, dear listener. Uh, we're going to talk about Alan Cummings' casting in the new series of Doctor Who. We're going to talk about Vorpcon. We're going to talk about the Target novel covers, um, which I did a little bit of a chat about uh, last time with uh, Mr. McLean, but uh, there's no reason not to cover that again. In fact, it wasn't McLean, it was Mr. Cavanna, but there's no reason not to cover that again. Christopher Eccleston and location shoots not only around Sheffield, but also Portsmouth. It's almost as if Cardiff doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we'll start with Alan Cumming, who accidentally uh, revealed that he has been cast in the new series of Doctor Who. Uh, Cumming, I don't know what Cumming's best known for. Is it, is it that god awful Son of Mask film, or, or is it, or is you, it you, Golden you, Eye? You, you let me joke, Christian. I was just going there with that, but so yes, <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got his CV up on the screen in front of me. I mean, I'm looking at it. I'm, th- I'm thinking he's been in some dreadful, dreadful films. He has. He was in all three Spy, all three Spy Kids films. I mean, oh god, yeah, I forgot about Spy Kids. Being in one Spy Kids film is. Unfortunately, being in two is just careless. Um, he turns up in Goldeneye. He was in uh, the, the Flintstones too. Um, oh, he was in Robbie and Michelle's High School Reunion as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Spice World. Goodness me. Well, I think uh, everyone was in Spice World, weren't they? That's true. Everyone was in Spice I World. I haven't yep. seen it. Jo- you haven't missed much. Josie and the no. Pussycats. Um, I will always know him as Nightcrawler. Yes, so of course, in the X Men movies. In which yeah. he is extremely good. So, yes, he yeah. is. I saw him as Hamlet actually, a long time ago. He was it was a touring production, and I saw it in Dartford. And what did you think of it? Uh, it wasn't a terribly good production. Let's put it like that. He was okay. Right. Um, bit bit wet. He was quite depressed actually. Uh, interestingly, I was in um, Stratford upon Avon over the weekend, and ah. we were as you do. Uh, as you do, yeah. And we, um, at the RSC, um, looking at there's, there's an exhibition they've got there about various things, and one of the um, things is an interactive video display about Tennant doing Hamlet, and the director there says actually Hamlet, to a considerable extent, is defined by who's playing Hamlet, yeah. and what they bring to it, and that is that, that is essentially the entire production. Um, so as far as if it wasn't a terribly good production, I wonder if he was actually. <laughs> I was being diplomatic. Yes. Uh, I've just I've just discovered, thanks to the magic of Wikipedia, that um, Alan Cumming has uh, written a novel called Tommy's mm. Tale. He's also written an autobiography called Not My Father's Son, a memoir. Um, he's had a cable talk show called Eavesdropping with Alan Cumming, and produced a line of perfumed products labelled. Oh coming you made that up i did not good lord somebody else might have done to be fair in this fairness yeah this is wikipedia but uh he's an obe as well mm. for uh presumably for services to 
Scotland. I don't know. Uh, oh. So uh, yeah, so he's apparently playing uh, Scottish <laughs> King James the Sixth in the new series of Doctor yes. Who, which he accidentally um, shared on Twitter. James the Sixth did. Um, Mr. Cumming did. Oh right, okay. Yeah. So that's interesting because we haven't had much casting with regards to. Uh... No, we know nothing. In fact, really. yes. No. Um, hence, hence one of my earlier uh, no says uh, there's another tweet from Mr. Cumming there, probably just coming denying that he's in the next series of Doctor Who. But uh, yeah, we we haven't heard much about the uh, new series of Doctor Who, so it's nice to have some stuff uh, to even go. Even though they were revealed prematurely. Even though. Even though they were revealed prematurely in this case. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. It's, it's, I think it was, wasn't it an interview he's supposed to have actually said this. I think it was another. I thought it was on Twitter. Was it on Twitter? Might have been on Twitter. Yes. I think I think it was in an interview for a podcast, uh, um, and then uh, he uh, come and then he confirmed it after the podcast had gone out. That's right. And then said, "Actually, I shouldn't have told you that yet. Sorry." Yeah. <laughs> Easily done, I should think. If you're a busy jet setting actor, he's. I mean, he's based in New York. How's he supposed to remember things like that with jet lag and what have you? Well, exactly. You don't know what you're supposed to be promoting and what's still under embargo. I don't blame him in the least. And I'm sure everybody else is actually quite pleased that this is out of the bag because now we can sort of think, hey, I'm coming playing King James on what's going to happen. So, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to think what happened in King James's reign. Authorised version of the Bible. There was that chap he was friends with, George. Well, he's, George... he's James the First of England. Yes. 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 Which indicates gunpowder plot, surely. There's no. no that's that's it. Yes, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, shame it went wrong, really. Well, that's a uh, controversial. The of Catholic England. <laughs> Say again. It will restore the glories of Catholic England. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not sure. The cat among the pigeons. Here. I'm not sure regicide is an apt topic for the podcast with a K. No. Although I do have my own su- superior regicide story, Go which, on. which it takes some beating. Yeah. So one of my ancestors, or, or not not direct ancestor, but direct, an ancestor from the same family, um, was uh, William Corley. Uh, it was William the Regicide, uh, one of the uh, signatories on Charles I's death warrant. Oh really? Oh, yes, well. and he was he was a uh, parliamentarian. He was an MP for Chichester, and oh, well. and there's this lovely uh, story that I I read on the interwebs about him. He um, held a town meeting to mm. discuss. Um, what they should do should the the um, the, uh, the, the the king's forces attack, yeah. um, and during the meeting the king's forces attacked. Oh my word! Which uh, Wait, always makes it, always tickles me that yes. story. Um, yeah. yeah, so so there you go, and he uh, legged it to uh, Switzerland during the restoration. Oh. So well, um, yeah, regicide news on the podcast with a K there. Yeah. So, so uh, you think it'll be about the gunpowder plot? It, well, it's th- not going to be about the authorised version of the Bible, is it's it? It's probably not about the Bible. He did have a boyfriend, though, wasn't he? He was gay. Oh, uh, that's great, because Doctor Who doesn't do enough stuff with gay things. No, no, it never comes up, I think. Yeah. yeah. No. I, I mean, I think, obviously, the, 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 the chatter about this has been, oh, are, are we going to see a purely historical drama? Mm. Yeah, for yeah. The first time in... Well, since I suppose since Black Orchid, it was the first, the, the, the last yeah. time we had anything that we might call purely historical in which there were no aliens involved at all. Um, and is this a throwback to the way the show was made in the sixties? Um, well, if it is the gunpowder plot as well, uh, yeah. there is a canonical issue there uh, because the Doctor Who the Adventure Game series in uh, two thousand eleven and two thousand and twelve were stated to be uh, canonical by the BBC. Oh. And one of those is the gunpowder plot. The final one was the gunpowder plot. Maybe the meddling monk gives Guy Fawkes nukes to blow up for the Houses of Parliament. Yeah, I'm liking that. Who's playing the monk? Uh, Stephen Fry. Oh, I'm not liking that anymore. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Dawn French. Dawn French. There you go. The meddling nun. Ken Dodd. Oh, too soon. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Alas, alas. He died, you know. He mm-hmm. did. Yes, he did. Yeah. You're supposed to say Diddy. Oh, oh, no, oh. Doddy. Yeah. Ah, yes, yeah. So, um, yeah. Actually, we should mention Ken Dodd as well because obviously he appeared in um, the Happiness the Patrol. 
Delton, Delton and Bannerman. No, Delton and Bannerman. Yeah. yeah, Delton and Bannerman. I'm thinking of uh, Richard Prysak for no reason. Uh, Delton and Bannerman. And uh, yes, yeah, sadly, Ken Dodd are the, uh, the last link to the old days of um, British uh, theatrical comedy has um, passed Thank away. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. What a nice day. What a nice day for sticking a cucumber through Patrick Moore's. No, was it Patrick Moore? No, it wasn't Patrick Moore, was it? Hmm. Archbishop of Canterbury? I Stephen know. Hawking's letterbox and saying the Martians have landed. <laughs> uh, Patrick Moore one was what a nice day for a run up to Patrick Moore saying shows your anus, Patrick. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will link to some uh, Ken Dodd on YouTube for you, uh, dear listener. Um, let us know what you think about the Alan Cumming casting. I think it's good. Um, it shows some uh, ambition from the Dot 2 production team, which I, personally speaking, I cannot speak for Simon or Mr. Baldock. Uh, but personally speaking, I, I did find that some of the decisions that have been made over the past few months lacking in ambition. So it's nice to see an yeah. uh, established actor there. Yes. Yeah. I was talking to my wife. I'm glad to hear that. Occasionally, I wear a talk to my wife. <laughs> and I was saying, you know, with the casting of a female doctor, you know, it's a. Oh, maybe this is too controversial, but it, it, it's a very safe choice going for J.D. Whittaker. Maybe they are just producing a safe, a, a safe show, but, you know, there are lots of um, very sort of quirky and unusual female actors out there. I don't know if I can still say actresses. And, you know, you could have gone for someone like Hayden Gwynn or someone like that, you know, somebody who would give a very unusual interpretation and said that, I know Jodie Whittaker's a very good actress, but, you know, they have gone for someone very mainstream, haven't they? Well, I mean, I was watching um, Miranda... Uh, yeah, and I thought Miranda Hart would have been an absolutely sensational doctor because I can yeah. see her being utterly stupid and having things with them um, bis- biscuit blasts and jokes and various other yes. shenanigans in the TARDIS. And then I can see her within the same breath staring down Davos. Yeah, from, and I, so I think she would have been splendid. And I agree with you, Whitaker is a something of a safe pair of hands in that respect. Yes, yeah. she may astound us. But, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, I think we're obviously entering uncharted territory. Yes. Uh, so it's uh, it's a little bit difficult to uh, put your finger on what's going to happen um, with this particular actress who is mm-hmm. obviously mm-hmm. at the fair forefront of a complete a complete uh, change for the show so there's very little we can say about that let's uh, just um, take that um, side point though regarding uh, an educational bent to the, to, to the episode at least because we've um, had a report in the mirror um, that says um, it, it implies that uh, Chibnall is keen to bring the show back to its 1960s roots when Sidney Newman intended it to be an educational series for children. Um, the source told the mirror, the Doctor has all the space and time to explore, so it'll be fascinating to see the gang from 2018 having a good rummage around in big, important events which have changed the course of history. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, they did abandon this idea in the 1960s. Um, for good reason as well. Yeah. So, uh, Have you mm. seen The Bane of Terror recently? Yes, it's on my DVD shelf. Way of Terror is one of those stories I confess I've never actually seen. Um, Have you it, not? My goodness me. Uh, I know. It's, it's, it, it's if you can't sleep at night, James, then <laughs> put the Reign of Terror. Uh, it, it's just deeply boring. Very, yeah. it's, it's very, very boring and very, very worthy. You know, hey kids, you should know about the French Revolution. It's interesting uh, that it's you, just you, you say that because I was actually watching and there is a slight Doctor Who connection here with uh, Anne Reid and John Cleese I was watching Hold the Sunset um, which uh, now I watched episodes 1, 2 and 4 uh, in yeah. daylight hours but episode yeah. 3 I haven't got to the end of yet because I kept putting it on iPlayer as I'm, while, <laughs> while I was in bed I couldn't get to the end of it I think there are certain shows and I like Hold the Sunset I think it's well written I know it's not it's not Frasier for God's sake um, yeah. it was perfectly good John Cleese is good in it everyone's good in it um, yeah and there's, there's, there's some good laughs in there. Uh, but I couldn't get to the end of episode three. And I think there's certain shows that you don't watch at a certain time of day because they can yeah, yeah. induce uh, somnambulism. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I went through a phase of watching um, uh, certain uh, bits of classic, mostly Seventh Doctor, actually, with um, uh, 
the child who is now 10. And mm. this is a couple of years ago. He really enjoyed the Happiness Patrol. He liked um, Delta and the Bannerman. He liked Silver Nemesis. But we watched um, Time in the Rani and we both fell asleep. <laughs> and this was only about seven o'clock in the evening. I've not seen it here, but it, it gives you an indication of how much I enjoy time of the time of the run. As you say, it's a great yeah. film, Tanya. I haven't seen the end of Fenric since 1989. Oh, for, for for scheduling, you know, personal scheduling, put the DVD on at yeah. bedtime reasons. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, let us know, dear listener, which Doctor Who episodes put you to sleep. Of an evening, um, and uh, while I'm while I'm uh, addressing you, dear listener, um, hopefully you're uh, enjoying the podcast so far. Perhaps you're uh, on the drive to work, long drive to work, or on the on the on the tube, perhaps, or maybe you're in a field running through corn with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, I would invite you to um, just uh, check us out on Twitter, on Facebook, even. This will astound you. On Instagram, uh, we are the podcast with a K, uh, or Caster Beyond on Twitter. And uh, also, you can listen to us uh, on the website, www.beyondcasterbus.com. Uh, you'll also find us on Audio Boom, iTunes, Stitcher.com, uh, TuneIn, through the TuneIn app, and a few other places as well. So, um, we, And we, we are attempting to expand our reach even further into almost unprecedented territory, which uh, we'll be able to tell you about soon. Uh, we're also on YouTube. So uh, there you go. Hmm. We're coming at you from all media. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we've talked about that, Mr. Cumming, in Doctor Who Series 11. Uh, so what, let's stick to Doctor Who Series 11. Uh, we've had some uh, location sightings. Yes, and they're not limited to Cardiff and South Wales, which excites me, no yeah. end. Good. So uh, we've had um, we've had um, recording in Sheffield recently, and also a uh, a name oh, I can't remember the name of the, 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 a sort of a suburb of Portsmouth as well has um, featured recently. Gosport. Uh, Gosport. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these places are distinctively not Cardiff. Um, mm. I understand that they're also filming to India. Really? Mm. Yeah, sure, it's a rumour about that. I think it's going to be um, a possible companion exploration story. It's, I think, they're good. Ah. I think, I think that, 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 that's, the, that's, that's one of the, the um, ideas floating around. It's going to be about exploring the legacy of... Um, one of the uh, companions and looking at her roots. Uh, yeah. How true this is, I don't know. We do know Rosa Parks is going to show up later on. Yeah. I think that the hints of South Africa filming. But uh, yeah. Did they go to the castle when they were in Gosport? Do you know? Can you give us a bit of background on the castle, James? Um, it's great. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an English heritage property. It is uh, well worth a visit if you're in that neck of the woods. Years ago, they had this lovely audio commentary, which was basically a, a French night and an English night spending um, the entire tour as you're walking around the inside the uh, the, the castle bickering with each other. Um, it was like a scene from a Monty Python film. Uh, <laughs> oh, very it's, sadly, I don't think that, that's there anymore, but the castle still is, and it's, uh, it's nice. I mean, I know nothing of Gosport apart from that, although there was a nice home and garden store down there as well. Bradley Walsh was spotted in the sale and make a pub, and <laughs> it's brilliant. Uh, there's no and and L student Lewis Jeffries, who studies film studies and creative writing at the University of Portsmouth and has a life of working for McDonald's ahead of him, uh, snapped <laughs> photos at Little Woodham, uh, a village which is styled on the 17th century. Ooh, so that may be a clue there. There's no mention of the castle. Actually, and... Lewis, Lewis Jeffries does pop up um, in on Facebook from time to time. He does write about this stuff as well. Right. Uh, for a one of those little sites that um, I I'm only with. joking, Lewis. Knuckle but, uh, down, yes. young man. Yeah, and uh, he's and he's 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 forging his way ahead in uh, in terms of getting Doctor Who work out and building up a portfolio. So uh, good for Lewis, good for you. Listening, hello, and um, yes, yes, yeah. It's it's what we do. It's what we do. <laughs> uh, so so that so that's happening, and, and um, good photos, Lewis, as well. Mm. So um, I mean, it's um, the, the Sheffield thing is the one that interests me the most because it's Sheffield, which is mm -hmm. like 
I was never one of these people who who expected to see the TARDIS land at the corner of the road as a child. I'm also not one of these people who saw the companion as um, the identification character. I was, I'm one of what you know. I'm old school. The Doctor was the identification character. Um, so to um, to have you know Sheff- Sheffield feels almost local. Well, this is not local, local. You know, it's it takes two hours to drive there from here. Um, but my, 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 my wife's family are from uh, Rotherham, so um, it, it almost feels like it's here where I live. So it would be nice if they actually came further up the A1 and maybe um, hit North, North Yorkshire rather than, rather than South Yorkshire, Doc. Um, we, will, we will see. We will see. South Yorkshire? You just said about the Doctor being the identification figure. Hmm. And that being old school. Whereas yes. if, we're talk- if we're talking 1963 old school, the companion is the identification figure. I think that is, f- from from the off, it is the companion because she's the, the um, Susan's the first person you see, isn't she? You see her before you see the Doctor. And I think it's like with Rose, um, that you meet Rose mm-hmm. before you meet the Doctor. But I think there is a, a large amount of Doctor Who fans uh, from the classic series era who see the Doctor as the identification character. Yeah. Simon, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I am intrigued. I am intrigued. Uh, I have no thoughts. I have never, <laughs> identified, I have never identified with Adric. Um, yeah, I don't know. Don't know. I suppose. I mean, I suppose Susan was. Susan definitely was the identification character, wasn't she? And yeah, Ian and Barbara weren't. They, they were they, the parent they characters, were and right? Bad, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, maybe. But I, you know, I never, I never identified with Turlo or Adric. Uh... But I mean, if the, the purpose of the companion is to feed the Doctor lines. Really, exactly. Is, yeah, is that, that say, is the real we, purpose. Doctor? What are you going to do now, Doctor? Yeah. Um, more than being identification, because you know, uh, don't know. I mean, blah, 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 blah. how many of us identify with somebody of a particular age? Don't know how many people identified with Adric. How many people identified with Rose? You know, I have to say I felt a strong affinity with Mel. Ah, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> actually, we talk about that. Um, we we mentioned Ken Dodd, Ken Dodd earlier, and I actually went back and rewatched the episode of um, Delta and the Bannerman in question, which features Ken Dodd. Yeah. Um, and Mel's behaviour throughout the entire exchange is utterly ludicrous in that you've got a situation where Ken Dodd um, is saying, hey, you've won a competition and you're going to go to Disneyland. And Mel is absolutely thrilled. I've never won anything before. Can we go to Disneyland? Can we go to Disneyland, Doctor? Like some sort of lovesick six-year-old, you know? Um, And I'm sitting there thinking, you've got a time machine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You could go to the opening day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, He's not... I mean, Ken Dodd in that episode actually isn't particularly titty hilarious, is he? No, he's, he's great. not really playing it as Ken Dodd. No, he's no, not. He had some good. He had some good serious um, credits over the years, didn't he? Yeah. Old Doddy, and of course he had. You know, he had one of the biggest selling hit singles of the nineteen sixties as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we uh, could not sing a medley of them. Well, maybe you could. I'm not sure. I can't. Oh. Actually, I tell you something I read years ago. That I can't. There was some aging European well, actress. Wherever you are. Told so, you, so, told you. <laughs> some sort of Greta Garbo person was on um, Desert Island Discs. I can't remember who she was, but um, they got to her. Uh, they said, right, tell, "Tell us your next choice. Tell us your next choice." Then, and she said, um, "I hope this is, isn't going to be too rude to include." She said, "Okay, um, I want a penis." What? <laughs> And there was a stunned stun silence. I said, yeah, look, we'll, we'll, we'll get to your luxury item later. We want... <laughs> well, what, what's your next record? I want a penis. Yeah, okay. Well, um, no, a penis. Ken Dodd, a penis. Yep. Um, <laughs> Radio 4, no stranger to controversy, of course, but um, yes. Mispronouncing news on the podcast with a K. Uh <laughs> Okay, let's um, let's. I mean, we've got a few other things we're going to chat about. Shall we talk about Eccleston? Yeah, because um, yeah. he's um, he's been interviewed. 
uh, ostensibly about his new Macbeth show performance show um, and he's uh, had a few things to say about what happened when he left Doctor Who sort of not the reasons why he left Doctor Who but the kind of fallout personally for him which uh, makes him uh, quite uncomfortable reading Mm. Um, he's basically said the BBC blacklisted him for quitting now you could wind back the clock and check Eccleston's career um, following Doctor Who and you'll find that he didn't do any any BBC work for about 10 years it's more like 5 is it 5? ok 5 but yes the, only, the first thing that came to mind was the um, the A word I couldn't think of yes. him being in anything before that on BBC. Uh, hang on a second. I'm going to check this out there because I actually had the same thought and thought, how long was it since uh, the departure of um, Eccleston that he was off the BBC? And as far as I can see, hang on a minute. So, yeah, so he did um, He did um, uh, Doctor Who in uh, 2005 and then he went to Hollywood and was in the likes of G.I. Joe, which, of course, he doesn't enjoy very much. Um he does. Turn he up did have a the... dreadful Scottish accent in GI Joe. Yeah, I, I confess I've not seen it. Um, 2010, he was in Lennon, Lennon Naked. Oh, was uh, that BBC? That was BBC Four, was it? BBC Four, yeah. That was right. an okay. Yeah. That now called Mori is your chrono as well, didn't it? It was well cast, and it had um, Andrew Scott as Paul McCartney. Yeah, it, which is a very good performance as Paul. There's. Um, there's lots of people doing Paul McCartney, but he kind of um, gets it um, spot on. Um, do you know, nice just going back to G.I. Well, Joe a moment. Yeah. He's actually... You know how they used his eyes in The Day of the Doctor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, um, just as um, Hurt is regenerating. In the second G.I. Joe movie, he's not in it, but they've used his eyes... In exactly the same way to to show that it is um, the same character. I, I think he was Destro. I might be wrong about that. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was um, worth mentioning. So um, so it's a five year gap then, I suppose. Yeah, but it's still long enough to be make you think. Yeah, maybe there was something going on there. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. He says, "What happened around Doctor Who almost destroyed my career. I gave them a hit show, and I left with dignity. And then they put me on a blacklist. I was carrying my own insecurities, as it was something I had never done before. And then I was abandoned, vilified in the tabloid press, and blacklisted." And um, for those of you with um, shorter memories, you may not recall uh, that Christopher Eccleston was a. Uh, It, how did it go again? He was like he was announced as leaving, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, but there was something wrong with the timing, or I think it like, was the day after the first episode. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Or, the, the, or, so or the timing was, was out. Very soon after, wasn't it? Yeah. And I think the press release from the BBC was not to his liking. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so he, he was in uh, the leftovers. He was uh, was a TV show. He's in Thor, The Dark World, which was the, the, the worst world. of the Thor movies. <laughs> it's a dreadful film. The, 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 worst, the worst of the um, the um, MCU movies, actually, I think. It's probably fair to say. I think it probably is, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and obviously he was nearly going to be in The Day of the Doctor. We've talked about this on Podcast with a K in the past. So, you know, just flick back to uh, 2013 um, for details of that. Um, I mean, should, should the BBC be blacklisting people because they've been unhappy? I don't know. I, don't, I suppose seems, it depends whether they silly. were or not. Whether it was just that he didn't get work and then concluded that he'd been blacklisted. Yeah. Um, well, as as if I'm somebody aware, came up to him in the bar and said, "Hey, Chris, you've been blacklisted." Yeah. You know, would you necessarily believe them? I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I don't well, he know. attributes uh, this to his agent. Um, yeah. According to yeah. The Independent, after making the decision to quit, he claims his agent warned him that the, quote, the BBC regime, unquote, was, quote, against him. Yeah. Um, I was told by my agent at the time, you're going to have to get out of the country and wait for regime, cha regime change. It sounds like he's in a sort of a dictatorship in South America. It does. It sounds like he's, no, it sounds like he's been doing <laughs> undercover ops in Iraq, basically. <laughs> uh... 
I just I I think it depends whether it was true. I mean, if it was true, then you know you you don't want public corporations behaving like that. And no, you don't. You know, I I I don't like saying we don't pay our license fees to so and so because it makes me sound like a sort of Daily Mail colonel type. Nevertheless, <laughs> um, given that the BBC is funded by the public, you would expect a certain sort of ethical standard of people who work there. And um, there was clearly some unpleasant behaviour on the Doctor Who set for... Yes. Not from Eccleston, but on the Doctor Who set for its first season. And um, Well, I, I, as it, I understand it, there was some unpleasant behaviour with regards to Mr Eccleston himself. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it was unprovoked, so... Yeah. Um, as I understand yeah. it, the, the, the vibe I get from certain people is, is um, difficult to work with. Of that old um, maxim about um, yeah, yeah, well, that's yeah, just having an opinion, isn't it? No, so, no evidence for it whatsoever. But yeah. it, from what from what I can understand, if things were difficult, it would perhaps be more likely to provoke a reaction from him than perhaps from. Um, Actors who were, let's say, less established and perhaps more inclined to hold the party line to get things done. Yeah, I think I, I get the impression that I've got a couple of things here. I mean, I get the impression that he was, you know, he's actually, if you see him interviewed, he's quite a quiet personality. You know, yeah. he's not ebullient and bouncy like David. He's not. Tate. He's not a star, is he? No, and therefore people perhaps preferred working with Tennant because he was bouncy and fun, and Eggleston yeah. is rather more broody and gets on with it. I'm not, I'm not um, saying he hasn't got box office, because obviously he's, he's, no, he's no, Macbeth no. at the RSC. Oh, yeah, but he's, 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 not, he's not, you know, big star guy. He's a serious actor guy. Yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah, he is. I mean, I think the other thing is that, you know, conversely, I've heard people say how easy he was to work with and uh, that yeah. he's a very nice guy. You know, he's a nice man to work with. Um, perhaps he doesn't lead a company in the way that, I don't know, that Pertwee did or something like that. But, um, yeah. If I, you were I, a young I, actor, I, if you were a young what? actor, if I just throw this in there, if you're a young actor, actress, um, and you have a choice of working with Christopher Eccleston, David Tennant, Matt Smith, or Peter Capaldi, which of those four would you choose? I don't know what Matt Smith or Capaldi are like to work with. Well, you don't know what any of them are like, work, like no. to work with. But in terms of, you know, um, what they've done and the status, and et cetera, yeah. I would think you'd probably go for Eccleston or Capaldi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Choosing my words, choosing my words carefully, um, I'm, I'm going to go with Capaldi because mm. from what I, I've got friends who've worked with him before who say how lovely he is, generally. Mm -hmm. how how keen to get on with the job in hand, but also how nice as yeah. well, um, and and welcoming, and I, I and I, everything that I sort of heard about him sort of indicates that he was somebody who got a balance right between you know going in and doing the best job he could, but also maintaining that sense of um, uh, contact with the people yeah. uh, about making the tea. Mm, so I yeah. choose him. Okay. Uh, Okay, but yeah, I think I think the point stands there. I think there is there is this different people work with different people in different ways, don't they? It's very yeah. difficult, you know. I mean, it's difficult enough. Um, you know, I don't work in an office um, staffed by anyone other than myself, um, and the, one of the reasons is that it is difficult to find the right blend of personalities to get the job done. Mm. Um, and the, the same is true in any walk of life, in any career, yes, any any type of work, place of work. I think one of the problems with this whole situation is that every time there is uh, there is a pattern, and every time Eccleston is interviewed, the pattern repeats. And what happens is that he's being interviewed to promote whatever film he wants, uh, or whatever, whatever film or TV series he's in, as you do when you're an actor, you know that's part of the gig. Um, but of course, the question is inevitably going to turn to Doctor Who because yeah. of the circumstances under which he left it, yeah. and the sense of animosity. So of course, when you're in that situation, you can't not talk about it because you know they'll make something up. Yeah. So, of course, he says something, and, of course, that's the headline they run with. And then you get the fan base saying, why is he constantly complaining about Doctor Who? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. the truth of it is he, he isn't. It's just that you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Yes. So, you, so you've so you got this 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 sense of negativity. Right? If he, I mean, all, all, he has, all he, he tells the truth or his version of the truth and 
perhaps with a certain um he's become increasingly candid over the years but he's not named names he's not given specifics um but of course it comes across as negative it's mm. like that old joke about the um uh, the, the the monk who's only allowed to say um two words a year um uh, under his vow of silence in the first year he says um oh uh bed hard and the abbot says oh I, I'll, I'll get that sorted i'll get a different bed for you and then it, a year later they get him back and he says oh food cold i said all right we'll uh, we'll um uh see if we can do something about the temperature and then the third year he comes back and says room cold and of course they say oh yes all right well we'll put a heater in there or something if you want and the year after that he's completed his vows the abbot says right you can talk again what do you want to say now and he says well i'm leaving the abbot says, I'm not surprised. You've been here four years. All you've done is complain. <laughs> <laughs> and broadly speaking, that is, that is Eccleston in the press about Doctor Who. Every time yeah. it comes up, that's what he says. Therefore, it's viewed as very negative. I refuse to accept that he did. He left that studio with not a single happy memory of his experience. Yeah. It's just that we don't get to hear about him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't take long to search the internet and find some um, nice stories featuring yeah. uh, Christopher Eccleston uh, yeah. meeting young fans so exactly yes yeah yeah I, I, I think he's he's he's, he's I, I think a lot of it and I said this the other day I think a lot of the anti Eccleston vibe stems from jealousy well not jealousy um, resentment that he won't do the conventions and he won't he won't play the fan game yeah in the way that his successors have mm-hmm. um, and that as far as I'm concerned that's his prerogative I think yeah. we should be throwing a hissy fit just because he doesn't turn up at Comic Con totally but that's, that's me you know, Patrick Troughton didn't do conventions for a long, long time. Very long time, yeah. yeah. What did Baker really, did he? I mean, Baker was notoriously difficult to work with. Oh, yeah. I think I think John Baker was much more difficult to work with uh, than, um, than Eccleston, by all accounts, especially towards the end. Towards the end, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so that's that. Um, now, we did talk about it briefly last week, but it's always good to get a uh, number of uh, different opinions on certain things on the podcast with a K. Mm-hmm. And um, my, my, my um, educated, my learned colleagues will know that there are some new Doctor Who books being yeah. released, Doctor Who novelizations, uh, in the Target style. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're by uh, Russell T. Davies, Stephen Moffat, James Goss, and Ginny Colgan. Yep. And they feature art by a, a gentleman called Anthony Dry who um, basically, uh, if it wasn't for Anthony Dry, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation um, now um, due to the um, very boring uh, hereditary um, of this podcast, uh, which I won't go into. So um, these um, lovely pieces of work have been uh, produced, um, these great great pieces of art um, adorning the cover of The Christmas Invasion by Jenny Colgan, uh, Twice Upon a Time, Russell T. Davies is Rose, um, James Goss is City of Death, and the Day of the Doctor's Stephen Moffat, or Stephen Moffat's The Day of the Doctor. I should, I'm, going, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Yeah. The, um, Mr. Dry did a version of the Christmas Invasion cover many, many years ago. It's not a secret because he had it on his website, but uh, he did a version of the cover <laughs> of that many years ago, and he's, he's basically reused the same elements and made it even better than it was in 2000 and, early 2006 which is uh, astonishing uh, I was fortunate enough to see these um, quite early on the rose cover um, he shared with me a few months ago uh, it's it's all stunning work he's um, absolutely at his best it's proper uh, you know there's the feel of Achilles but with the mm. the, um, the the directness I suppose of um, the modern technology brings to it what, what, what do you think of these covers very good yeah very good indeed. Yeah, I'm liking them. They look authentically Target-ish. Yes, yes. I like the way he's doing the Daleks as well. They look like Christos Achilles's early Dalek illustrations. Yes, they do. Yes. And they've got that that TV twenty one element, and yet retaining the NSD Dalek uh, elements too. I'm a god with admiration. Absolutely. And what do you think of the choice of novels, though, from the BBC? Or novelisations, I should say. Because um, it is quite a mix, isn't it? Obviously, Twice Upon a Time, um, which is the last episode of the yeah. screen to date, uh, Christmas Invasion, Rose, City of Death, which obviously has mm. never been novelised, um, 
and the day of the doctor um i don't know yeah they're, they're, they're reasonable choices um maybe some of the others would have been more interesting be interesting to see if uh, Paul Cornell does another version of human nature. <laughs> yes. Well, although, although, I mean, human nature, the original novel, is about as far as tar- from, far from target as you can get. It, it is, yes. Yeah. It's, very, it's very, very good. But, it, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, the, the target novel of that TV episode, as good as it will undoubtedly be, is going to sort of pale into insignificance next to... Um, I do hope they can get Terrence Sticks to write one of them, though. I know he's getting on a bit, but it'd be very good. I'm, I'm looking at the cover for Rose, and what I like about it actually is the fact that, Ro- that Rose's head is noticeably bigger than the Doctor's. Mm. They, the way they've layered that, so that she is—I mean, and she's not, well, not exactly a colour image, but sort of blended to look almost colour. Whereas he's a black and white picture that's sitting quite firmly behind her, um, which that's I think a- says an awful lot about the episode. That was, I think, with Achilles' covers, though, wasn't it? That he always did, or nearly always did, the Doctor in black and white. Yeah. Yeah, you've got the um, the Day of the Doctor cover, and you've got two Doctors in black and white and the older Doctor in sepia. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, great stuff there. They're your, um, now, they're, I'm not entirely sure what the release date of those is. Um, it must be very soon, because there is a signing at the Forbidden Planet London Megastore on ah. Friday, Friday the 13th of April from 6 to 7 and I do know that uh, Mr Dry is travelling down um, from uh, Liverpool um, to attend that well according to a um, well known uh, entertainment news site uh, the books are going to be released on Friday the 5th of April so not, 5th. Well, on the oh, okay. 5th of April whatever date that is not, it's probably not on Friday but, um, yeah. but uh, yes by 6 99 each yeah, excellent. not too bad. Not too bad. Fifth of April is a Thursday. Is a Thursday, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's um, the target novels, the modern era. Um, let us know, dear, dear listener, which uh, which tar- which Doctor Who episodes you'd like to see novelised in target style form, adorned by Anthony Dry's art. Um, I'm not for any moment suggesting that the BBC will continue using Mr. Dry for these um, publications. Um, but let's face it, they probably should. Christian, do you have one that you'd like to see? I do. And that would probably... Do you know, I'd like to see... Um, I have a couple. I'd like to see The Unquiet Dead. Um, yeah. But I'd also yeah. like to see how um, the... Um, how the um, the end of that series is um, fares in novelised form because it's a, yeah. it's it's a bit of an epic, um, but li- likewise the end of the following series as well. Indeed. Um, so um, the parting of the ways and um, and then the, the year after, um, Doomsday and uh, Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. I'd like to see both of those novel novelised because obviously the two parties for start off. Um, yeah. But you know there's such a lot going on there, and they, they do have an epic cinematic swing to them. Especially the second one, but the, the first one, you know, is that, 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 you know, you've got the regeneration, but you've also got the cliffhanger of the previous episode as well, which is um, also one of the best resolutions to Dot Two cliffhanger. And it also, I think, the two that two parter flies in the face of everything that's been said about two parters in New Who, um, because it doesn't, yeah, you know, they, they, oh, we've got to do it a different way in the second part, otherwise people will be bored. Um, yeah. You know, they, they did it at the end of the last series. Uh, but you know they don't do that with the parting of the ways. It's it's um, you know it's it's bad wolf and parting of the ways. It's it's just a continuation of the adventure and it works perfectly. It's a great great story. Yeah, that's what that's what I would say. Anyway, mm. well, uh, what about you guys? Revelation of the Daleks. Yeah. Um. Sleep no more. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Controversial. No, I'd sleep no more gets a very bad place. It does. We, we, we should address I, I this like at some it. point in the future. We should do that, shouldn't yeah. we? I like it far more than most other people do, I think. And at least it was different, so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it may have to be different, and uh, it does have a lot to... Uh, 
and a lot of people didn't like it at the time I didn't mind it myself um, it wasn't perfect it certainly wasn't imperfect uh, well we'll leave that behind and we'll, we'll maybe give uh, Sleep No More some attention at some point in the future yeah. uh, that future may or may not be before Sunday the 9th of September where at the print works in Manchester Warp, an independent celebration of Doctor Who is taking place that's uh, Sunday the 9th of September uh, among the guests are, um, well, Paul McGann, Peter Davison, Colin hey. Baker. Hey. Uh, it's, um, it's looking like being a, a, a very great day. It's, um, Gareth Cavana is involved. Uh, yeah. there, are, there are panels. And um, we're looking forward to it. I'm ho hoping I'm going to be able to go. So um, there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot being squeezed in, and there's um, there are simultaneous events taking place. Mm. Uh, so uh, and there's there's a few uh, things still to be announced as well. Good. So um, that's that's looking very good. That's in September. Um, there, there, there's a Troughton stage, a Hartnell stage, and a Pertwee stage, which is uh, yeah. nice. And there's various things: stripping the Doctor, Doctor Who magazine, a Doctorless universe, the music of the universe. Crashing through time, Graham Harper uncut, which kind of suggests that Graham Harper might be there. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there you go. That's uh, worth checking out. And the great thing about this um, is um, that it is not an overly exp expensive convention. Mm. Um, tickets are available from uh, twenty pound. Gosh! Uh, so that's good. There is a um, VIP version. Which um, you know, a Q Buster type of version for two hundred and fifty pound, which is um, probably intended for uh, industry professionals and super fans. Um, but yeah, twenty pound will get you a, a lot of stuff on that, day, and that's good value for a convention. Um, wouldn't you say, Simon Danes? Sounds uh, tremendously exciting. I might even go. And uh, if 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 Manchester and September are too far away, where where would you recommend for a convention, Simon? Uh Oh, God, You're just think. encouraging him now, aren't you? Um, <laughs> can't think. Coming soon, Bedford Who Charity Con 4. And when's uh, that? Saturday the 7th of April. Lots of tickets. No, sorry, few tickets. Few <laughs> tickets still available. <laughs> no, we do have lots of tickets available. We have plentiful supplies of tickets available. One of the things that I'm sure Gareth and the other The Warp, The Warp, The Warp, organisers will find is that um, this time in the lead up for con to conventions it's just over three weeks till R1 the convention organisers start, start panicking uh, people always buy their tickets at the last minute, they're always intending to go but they always uh, buy them at the last minute and it rather causes convention organisers to panic because they think oh god is anybody going to come um, this may be letting out too many trade secrets but uh, it's always the way most people buy their tickets at the last minute and you get lots of emails saying, oh, God, I haven't got a ticket. Are there any left? Um, but, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing well. It's going to be good. I've even written some sketches. Oh. Yes. Are these comedic sketches? Bedford. Comedic sketches, yes. Yes, they're most amusing. Um, because it's in Bedford, Bedford is, of course, the site of the Dalek Mines. Um, so there is a sketch being written on that theme which will be terribly funny, assuming I can get somebody to perform it. Will it be uploaded to social media? What? I think, I think the world deserves to see these. There, uh, there are a couple we did last year that are on um, YouTube, actually. Okay. Yep. And they're on our uh, Facebook page, too. There's Peter Purvis and Maureen O'Brien doing one, which is... Um, I, I thought it was tremendously funny, but then I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else oh, laugh? There's another, one, there's another one we did with Jeffrey Beavers uh, as the master, and he was visiting a psychiatrist who was played by Maureen O'Brien. That's funny, too. Good. Is that on YouTube as well? Yep. yep, and it's on our Facebook page, Bedford Who Charity Con Facebook page, which is always worth a visit. And how much are tickets to Bedford Who Charity Con? Uh, depends. Oh, all right. So yourself. <laughs> 42 pounds 50 pence for adults cheap okay. good um, no, and, and, and then we've got family tickets and uh, concessions and things like that and of course it's not lining your pockets is it nah 
Nah, don't make a penny, mate. So the, 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 the charity it, it, is... Bedford Food Bank. Yeah. It's a tremendous boost to my ego, though, so, you know, I get <laughs> out of it. <laughs> Uh, and I get to drink. I, I I get to drink with the guests sometimes. Lovely. So that's yes. Bedford Who Charity Con. Uh, yes, thanks, which thanks takes place on that. April the seventh. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, I'm I'm sure you'll have lots to tell us afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we'll have to do a debrief podcast. Oh God. Undoubtedly. <laughs> uh, so um, that brings us to the end, I think, of uh, this week's chat. I would um, I would encourage you, dear listener, to um, get hold of tickets to any conventions you fancy. Um, conventions are going through a bit of a uh, regeneration and renaissance at the moment. I feel with a um, a stripped back approach. Uh, so um, yeah, ch- check out for ones that are nearby with good guests and with a bit of history behind them. Uh, if, if not from the actual convention itself, then the people involved, and uh, and uh, get yourself along to one. Um, if you've any comments on uh, Alan Cumming, Target Novels, Christopher Eccleston's uh, recent revelation, Doctor Who shooting around the United Kingdom and further afield, or even old Ken Dodd, um, drop us a line on Twitter or Facebook or at beyondcasturbis.com. Or you might even, and no one's done this yet, you might even um, head to uh, the Audio Boom, Boom page, audioboom.com, mm-hmm. And uh, find the podcast there and leave us a reply, an audio reply, because you can actually do that. Um, I I wait. It's happening with bated breath, nevertheless. Uh, Until next time, from uh, Simon Danes, James Baldock, and myself, it's goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, all. This is a Beyond Casturbers podcast. Available on iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher.com, Player FM, and BeyondCasturbers.com. Beyond Casturbers.